we're going to be talking about modern workplace solutions. So um, in this session, we'll show you how to look, unlock additional value from your existing ERP investments, both in SAP and in your um, Microsoft uh, landscape as well. We've got lots of technology overviews, lots of demonstrations, sample reference architectures, all delivered by certified experts within the Azure technologies. So first person we've got is Akrash. Uh, welcome to Akrash. So um, Akrash, tell, tell me about the modern workplace. Hi Dan, good afternoon everyone. The nature of work has been changing due to fast paced digital transformations and advent of new products and technologies across the workplace, especially with the current COVID scenarios. Companies are looking for a way to scale, keep up the productivity without increasing their headcount or investing in massive software overall projects. Microsoft Modern Workplace is a plethora of proven solutions with which the customers can improve employee productivity, create more seamless collaboration across locations and platforms while maintaining the security and integrity of systems and data. So we've got a number of services um, listed in front of us. So how does Azure and how do these services help clients achieve uh, what you've described? So if you look at the services, all of these uh, are past offerings that are fast to activate and all seamlessly integrate with each other. They are quite mature as a platform. As you can see, we have low code mobile apps, plug and play automation. Uh, we also have chatbots, cognitive services, integrated security, user management, workflow, mixed reality and IoT. All of these can be combined in different ways to create infinite use cases. And we'll see some exciting demos of these. Cool. So I can see chatbots there. We've got some IoT down here. We've got Power Apps, so that could be mobile, mobile applications, email, Teams for chat, video conferencing, mix. All of these things can be joined together into any kind of um, um, uh, use case, business use cases. And I think that's probably the beauty of Azure: the fact that these do just nature, or Microsoft technologies, I should say, they just naturally talk to each other very yeah. easily. Okay, cool. Uh, it's quite a very powerful solution. So what kind of experience is required to create some of these use cases? Uh, so these platforms have a very fast learning curve since they have uh, basically a low code drag and drop option, which is similar to creating flowcharts. And you can also have a customized heavy version as well. And they're well documented tutorials online. Uh, so there are different flavors available based on the user set and the company maturity uh, that you will have. So for both of these, uh, it can be incorporated. Great. So I think um, you mentioned a uh, nice, easy GUI um, for, for these different services. We saw some of that early one today from the presentations that Rob and, and Prashant and Will gave. So interested to see if there's, a, if, if there's consistency there. Yeah. So today's session, next four, however long we've got left, <laughs> 70 minutes, we're going to be talking about different versions and permutations of most of these different, most if not all of these different services, yeah. aren't we? Okay. And that will give some uh, food for thought for our uh, clients out there to understand what kind of solutions they can incorporate. Right. So today we're going to show the best bits. <laughs> so we've got identity management, an overview of that, some IoT, uh, Internet of Things, I see sensor telemetry from machines, devices. Um, we can create digital twins out of that. I've got a demo. You probably might have teased you with some digital twin holographic uh, technology in the intermissions with the brake slides. I do hope you probably saw some of that. We'll show you, go through some of them again. <clears throat> we'll bring in uh, some AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, cognitive services, show you image recognition, chatbots, automation bots, that's the RPA, mixed reality experiences, and, and how uh, mobile technologies, mobile apps can be mixed in with mixed app, mixed in with mixed reality, if that makes sense, <laughs> yeah. brought together with mixed reality to create exciting solutions for in-field operations and remote, remote, and remote operations as well. So, um, first, we've got identity management. So we've got one of our colleagues, Hamad. Welcome, Hamad. Hi, so, how are you doing? Um, so tell us why um, identity is so important. Right. So um, if, we, if we rewind the clock to simpler times, it was a lot easier for organizations to manage their security because uh, they had employees come into the office, log on to their work PC, which was probably hardwired to the organization's network, and they would have access to on-prem applications. So security was very easy to manage because boundaries were quite definable. 
modern enterprise identity management is more complex. Look at where we are right now, especially with COVID going on, we got everybody working from home. So that means that individuals are working on their personal networks. When it comes to devices, people are expected to use a range of devices such as mobile devices, smart watches, personal laptops, and talvis. And they want to be able to do that in different locations and in different countries. The, Flexibility, isn't it? Exactly. That's an expectation of most employees these days. Yeah. So the expectation of people is to be able to travel around the world and still be able to access their corporate ID systems. And they want to give their partners and customers access to their data as well. This ends up with a complicated matrix of possible scenarios that need to allow users to do and, of course, protect against. The one thing that can bind and secure these different items together is cloud identity. Okay, cool. So uh, Gart I remember reading Gartner suggested, I think by 2021, that um, identity as a service would be the major access model for enterprises. C correct. So people are using multiple networks, multiple devices, there are multiple locations. So the only fixed thing in all of that is identity. We see identity as a control plane. So identity became the hub to manage this complicated matrix of possible scenarios. It safeguards your core assets on-prem and in cloud, control the identity, and you control everything else. So why would I want to integrate with Microsoft Identity? So Microsoft Identity gives you the ability to control all of the different variants within the modern, work for, uh, modern workplace. So you can control access to individuals, access to specific devices, and range of other different scenarios, such as implementing MFAs. There is so, so you can force, so you can force MFAs. That's multi-factor authentication. Yes, correct. So you could force that if you, if if the system, if Microsoft Identity found that a user was um, logging on in a different country to where they were five minutes ago, yeah. or specific or smart watches, you might want to put specific additional levels of security on that. Yeah. It gives you that flexibility to, to manage that. Correct? It does indeed. So there is tracking in there to track the location of individuals when there's a suspicious login activity based on devices and based on working locations. There is some clever machine learning in the background that helps with all of this. So identity works across all different types of applications, networks, devices, and locations. So it helps kind of the security, enterprise secu security um, <clears throat> team um, provision additional levels of flexibility to the enterprise whilst maintaining the level of control. Yes, it does. Great. So what would you say are the five main benefits of identity? Yeah, so there are five main benefits of using Microsoft Identity. Uh, one would be reduce the sign-in friction for both you and the people that have access to your system, enhance security. So many of our customers have asked about security and made demands on how the app is secure. You and your customers will be able to leverage a suite of security capabilities uh, that comes with Microsoft Azure Active Directory. Uh, comply with IT, reassure your customer's IT team that your app is safe and secure by meeting enterprise security and compliance requirements. And finally, integration. During this session, we'll talk about a wealth of resources that are available in Azure Cloud that makes integration easy. So you got any metrics to, to show us? Yeah, so some interesting stats. Microsoft Azure Active Directory already has 1.3 billion identities. So it's not just holding Microsoft identities, it's holding Google, Amazon, and all these different ones down there. So it's already integrated with other cloud applications. 22.5 million organizations have their identities managed within Microsoft Azure Active Directory, and that's huge. So by integrating with AD, you are already joining an established data set. So if you're thinking about applications for you, for your customers or your partners, there's a high chance that they're already in there, so it's easy for them to integrate. Wow. So uh, it's worth noting that I think, I think these stats are based from February this year and they're going to be updated. February last year. Last year. Last okay. year, yeah. Um, and they're going to be updated soon? Yeah, uh, within a couple of months, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, brilliant. So um, what if what if companies don't currently use uh, Azure Active Directory? What do they do? Right, so this is a question that I get asked a lot. Well, they will already have an on-premise Active Directory. The IT professional can simply install Azure AD Connect agent on one of their servers. This will collect identity and sync 
all of those uh, with, with those in the Azure Active Directory tenant, the IT professional will have a number of options, including sync passwords for single sign-on. Now that single sign-on is enabled, that means the same credentials that you use to log into your PC would be used to access your on-prem applications. Great. So, um, pardon me. So, so it's just a simply installing some software, a little bit of configuration, and then it just there's a syndication process already built in. Yes, and most importantly, all of this is free, no cost to you and your customers unless you want the premium features. So how how are the how are my applications managed um, within uh, the Active Directory? So uh, so Microsoft had this thing called Azure AD App Gallery, and what that means is that if you got an application that you want to make public but to a controlled audience, to your customers, to your partners, you can create an application using Active Directory using OAuth or SAML and apply for the application to be published to the App Gallery. And what that means is that you can basically authenticate your customers to have access to that and then uh, and then they can come and use it, download it like an App Store. It's, it's an App Store for controlled users. Great. So if you want, if you provision some data, you could model model that data as we saw earlier on. Create a web form or an application, um, or this could be an existing application you already have, yeah. um, and then provision that to dedicated partners and customers, yeah. and and then control what devices, what locations, who, which users can, and what times of day if you wanted yeah. to, yeah. Um, when when and where and how they could use it. Yeah, absolutely. Great. That's interesting. Great. So um, thank you very much, Hamad. Thank you for having me. So next, we are going to talk about IoT, so the Internet of Things. Uh, we've got Sarge, who's Hi, our cert certified IoT expert. He's going to talk to us, uh, give an overview, tell us some about the weaknesses within IoT, which anyone thinking about going down the IoT direction needs to uh, just be um, uh, mindful of, regardless of which technolo cloud technologies you're using. Show you some reference, architecture, reference architectures and then go through a demo. So, um, Sarge, give us give us give us some background in in the internet world of the Internet of Things. Yeah, sure, Don. Uh, yeah, we have sensors all around us today, generating vast amounts of data. A majority of this information is collected and not managed in a way to get value from it. And what we are seeing is that the data arrives much faster than it can be consumed and processed in high volumes and high varieties. That's to do with the number of sensors, how many sensors, how many how much telemetry each sensor can okay, bring, yeah. and then the rate at which it's throwing data out, uh, yeah. the volumes are huge. Exactly, yeah. so yeah. we run into the problem at collecting data at scale. Another problem that we often see is how do we model our data back to the 3D world? And I think the biggest challenge of all with IoT deployments is security. How do you ensure that your devices, your network is secure? And another challenge we all, all, all also see is that how do we gain real-time insights and prediction from the high volumes of data that are coming in in real time? This is like machine learning, exactly, isn't it? It's mining, yeah, yeah, mining, mining that, that. those big mm. data sets to surface those insights in order to kind of predict the future based on what you've seen in the past. Okay, so you, you did mention security vulnerabil vulnerabilities there. Can you be more specific? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so the physical processes used in many IoT devices today are not designed to deal with modern cyber attacks. The, these are the microchips. Microchips within yeah. your sensors. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, they're designed on architectures that are decades of years old. So with billions of new devices connected each year, it's more important than ever to secure yours. A uh, famously recently published cyber attack includes the Mirai botnet attack, where hackers exploded highway traffic cameras at large scale, bringing down the internet on the entire east coast of USA. Another, yeah. so, so this is some uh, a range of um, internet Wi-Fi enabled um, street cameras, yeah. yeah, IoT cameras, which somebody hacked into, and then connected all the hundred thousand of them together, and then used that to start causing mischief exactly. in a, America. Yeah. Okay. And as you say, there's a second one. Yeah, another one. Uh, the famous Vegas casino attack. So in this case, a smart thermometer was placed in an aquarium just to measure the water temperature. Hackers exploited it and stole information about high casino rollers. Wow. Okay. So it's an innocent thermometer in the reception exactly. area of a, no one would have a casino. Water, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing, isn't mm. it? They seem you, you need to be very careful about um, which devices you use, where you put them, etc. So 
companies need a really thorough IT security governance wrapper around any thought processes yeah. around IT enablement. I think we can't talk about IoT and Azure in the same sentence without mentioning Azure Sphere. Um, just give give us a quick overview. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. So Azure Sphere provides a 360 degree end-to-end -end comprehensive turnkey solution for highly secured IoT deployments, including your hardware, your operating systems, and components. It actively protects devices, your business, and your customers. We could spend the entire session talking about this, but I'm just mentioning here for further research if you're exploring IoT devices and management. Okay, so lots of information online, Google Azure Sphere, lots of really good videos, Azure Friday videos, uh, well worth well worth a watch on YouTube. Um, so let's let's have a look at uh, some reference architectures for IoT implementations and if you could guide us through them, Sarge. Yeah, sure. Here's a sample reference architecture of a typical end-to-end -end IoT deployment. So on the left, we have a I we have our IoT devices that are pushing data telemetries into the cloud, IoT hub to be more specific. And from here, we have two routes. For, uh, for a hot path, also known as your real-time analytics, we take the top route and route the telemetry data to stream analytics to so gain predictive uh, insights. So stream analytics is an Azure PaaS service offering. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then we have another route for a warm slash cold path. So in this case, you take the bottom route and transform the data ready to be stored in a storage system such as your Azure SQL database or your blob storage for historical data. Finally, we can access that historical data using Azure Machine Learning and find historical trends for predictive analytics. Okay, interesting. So um, you, you mentioned that there's some complexity in managing hierarchies of the sensor telemetry and the you know, the, the vast numbers of sensors mm. and and um, complexities around that. Can you give us some more information? Uh, yes, uh, we can use Azure Digital Twin. So in this slide, you can see how it integrates with the previous architecture. In this case, Azure Digital Twin uh, provides a, in Azure Digital Twin, we can define a hierarchical structure of unlimited length. So you could have a region, city, machine, and then find a particular location on that machine. Or, uh, or even in a, in a, in a non manufacturing non-equipment scenario, you could facilities is quite common. Yeah, definitely, yeah. You've got a thermometer in a room which exists on a floor, floor yeah. in a okay. building, in a campus, city, city yeah. country, so exactly, on and so forth. Yeah. So I think most most IoT applications have got some kind of hierarchy in mm. which uh, they, they live and can be modeled in, in digital twin service. Exactly, yeah. The idea is to include a 3D spatial context report rather than just a 2D flat report. Yeah, yeah, it just makes it going to be easy, contextually um, aware. So, um, so it's a central place to go for uh, to help you easily navigate and analyze what could be millions of sensors across an enterprise. So I think it highlights the scale and thought that Microsoft have, have already put into the design of these services to make them available for when companies embark on the on these journeys. Cool. So um, I think next we're going to um, talk talk us through. <clears throat> yeah. This fun bit of Lego kit, which yeah. I think some people will recognise that if they've seen us at any any SAP and Microsoft events in the past. Do you want to take us through that? Yes. Yeah, so we have, here we have our Lego excavator model. So one of the primary function is to mine different coloured sweets like your M and M's, Smarties, you name it. And this whole so model it moves, doesn't it? This yeah, is it a Lego, Lego technique. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it actually moves. Yeah, Batteries eventually. have run out at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, so this model is covered in a lot of different IoT sensors. For example, you have your vibration sensors on the belt, temperature sensors, and your cameras as well. The idea is all the sensor telemetry is pushed into Azure. IoT Using hub. that reference architecture. Uh, reference so architecture, exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then we can use AI to de determine what type of suite it is. And we have also the ability to integrate data back into SAP. And finally, we can represent the holograph, uh, the telemetry data back into a holographic digital twin. Wow! So we've created a, a digital version of this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and we've applied all of the sensor telemetry that comes off this into Azure, modeled it using Azure Digital Twin Services into a 3D hologram, visible on a Hololens device to give that 3D spatially aware contextual yeah. view of that data. So this is what the and then this is the result, isn't it? Yeah. This is what we use for demos to help uh, 
Um, exactly. Yeah, but I think before we start, I think this was captured using this device here. So I'm just going to put this on and for the user to see. Oh, this is a HoloLens, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A HoloLens device, which yeah. you simply put on. And the idea is that you have this transparent TV glass that interacts with your physical environment to place holograms and objects. Uh, so, for example, you could place a hologram on top of a table. And this is the main functionality of that we see. So we're going to talk more about mixed reality yeah, yeah. Uh, next. So uh, if I flick back, we're going to be able to see what this actually looks like in, in, in reality. So take, take us through what yeah, this is. So we have a, a digital twin, as you can see here. I'm scaling it up. And we have four health bars and as a percentage. And then so, I'm so green for good, red for bad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then I'm exploring the model to inspect the broken component further. In this case, the bucket scoop, as you can see, it, that's bucket scoop is down. And then I'm placing it to a convenient location. The hologram is spatially anchored to the real world, so I can move around it, see what I want to see. And then I can have the ability to click the health bar. And as you can see here, can inspect what's actually wrong with it. In this case, the values that are coming in are, is outside the expected tolerance. So if I'm an engineer, I, yeah. I'll be, I'm, I could just, I could be looking at, be stood in front of the physical machine, and then this is basically telling me a heat map of all the problems exactly, with that machine. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't have to be a machine in a utilities mm. uh, scenario. We could be looking at a, a plant, uh, processing plant. Uh, there's lots of applications, uh, isn't there? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then we can, the beauty of this is that we can disassemble it and get down to the root causes. Root causes exactly. Uh, we don't exactly. have to take the physical machine to bits. bits yeah. We could physically, we can do it virtually. Mm. 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 And how long does it take to create these holographic models? So in this case, yeah, because the digital twin was 4,000 pieces part. 4,000 parts, yeah. 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 That modeling, is, uh, the 3D modeling itself took a few weeks time. Once uh, we got that, that working, another week or two, we've got the, the digital twin with yeah. all that you see in front of you. And, and what if a customer's already got existing uh, CAD files, computer-aided design mm -hmm. files? So they part, give us their computer-aided design files, and we can upload it straight away and start using it. Oh, so it doesn't so take two weeks. Exactly. It's just upload it straight in, yeah, and then, and then yeah. it's just a matter of attaching the sensor telemetry yeah. po points to where it is in the model. Exactly. Yeah. OK, yeah. interesting. Brilliant. So I think now that with the uh, we see the nationwide rollout of 5G technology, uh, there's it's, we're seeing a, a huge amount of client adoption in this space. Uh, the technology is moving quick, very quick. Uh, so it's going to be very interesting to see uh, more of these, these these use cases. Thank you very much, Sarge. Thank you, Doug. So next, we are going to be talking about AI and cognitive services. So I'll get rid of my Lego. OK. And we've got uh, Hamad here. So. Uh, we're going to be covering three different subject areas. We've got uh, image recognition uh, processing using uh, uh, custom vision, which is another Azure service, uh, PaaS service, robotic process automation, automation using Power Automate, and virtual assistants using chatbots. So first of all, Hamad is going to take us through um, uh, cognitive solutions. So give us an overview, Hamad. Right, so Azure Cognitive Services are APIs, SDKs, and services available to help developers build intelligent apps without having direct AI or data science skills or knowledge. Uh, Azure Cognitive Services enable developers to easily add cognitive features into their applications. Uh, goal of this mature service is to be able to help devs create applications that can see hear, speak, understand, and even begin to reason. The list of services within Azure Cognitive Services can be categorized into five main pillars. Uh, you have vision, speech, language, knowledge, and search. So Azure has provided uh, these plug and play AI capabilities that drive business impact through rich and user experience. With just a few lines of code, you can bring computer vision to your factory floor using Azure Custom Vision. You can give e-commerce experience a human touch with bots using Azure Chatbot Service. You can empower companies to spot anomalies in real time using Azure Anomaly Detector, help hospitals extract critical data from patient records using Azure Form Recognizer, and communicate with people across the world with no language barriers using mm -hmm. Azure Speed Services, and we and we can we can see an example of that later on with the uh, yeah, and I think the beauty of all of this is these are PaaS services that exist in Azure, and 
if you want to start using them, you just switch it on and start using it. Yeah. That's the beauty of, of, of the Azure platform. Yeah. Um, I've got some data. I now want to point it towards speech and get some insights from that. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. So next slide, um, we're going to talk about, this is the first of the three different use cases we've got. Um, image recognition using a service called Custom Vision. And Hamad, again, you're going to give us a, an overview. So um, uh, tell us about what is Custom Vision. Right. So uh, Custom Vision lets you build, deploy, and improve your own image classifiers. What are image classifiers? Image classifiers applies labels to images according to visual characteristics. So how would you, how would I use Custom Vision then? Right. So Azure Custom Vision uh, basically provides customers with a very user friendly portal. You upload images to the portal and apply the labels. Click train, and within a couple of minutes, you're, you are done with your model training. It gives you the results on how well your model has performed. And then in the end, it provides you with an API that you can quickly hit to tag your new images. So how, how does this actually look on, say, a factory floor then? Right. So to ensure quality and consistency, you need to have an eye on your products and their defects. Cust Azure Custom Vision does that for you. So what you're seeing here is a high-level architecture diagram for a manufacturing quality control. Uh, you start by taking pictures or video of the component. And this is what this is one that we did. We're using these components, isn't it? It's yes. a manufactured um, turbine Force blade. Milk yes. compressor wheels. Yeah. And then you, you once you you've taken your pictures or your videos, you send it to IoT Hub. From IoT Hub, you basically ping it to the Azure Custom Vision to the API that you have just trained in the previous slides. And then you ca it comes back with a label result, and then you can store it in Azure Blob Storage. From Azure Blob Storage, you can visualize these results in Power BI for insights and actions to maintain quality standards. Great. So again, these are all Azure services that you just switch them on and yeah. join them together, start yeah. using it. Great. Yeah. So um, how accurate is the detection? Right, so a correctly trained model with decent number of images to train on will be able to detect cosmetic changes such as scratches, uh, as you can see in the slide, and then it gives you a probability for each label that you have trained. I mean, there's clear benefits at this level of uh, automatic inspection, isn't Indeed. there? Indeed. How long did it take to create this process? So it only took me a couple of days uh, to build this from end-to-end -end solution. Wow. So again, pass service, switch it on and start using it. Great results yeah, within correct. weeks. Yeah, correct. That's the beauty of Azure Plug and Play Services. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Hamad. Sure. Thank so, you for having me. OK. Uh, next, we're going to uh, speak with uh, Akrash. Again, welcome back, Akrash. He's going to take us through robotic process automation using using Azure. Um, give us an overview, show some reference architectures, demo, SAS, a demo of SAP data entry, where yeah. we've got a a uh, process that's going to take away some of the pain of, of logging invoices into SAP, uh, which I know a lot of companies, I know we certainly do, uh, have a painful process there. So, um, okay, over to you, Akrash, um, give us, take us through it. So when you talk about AI, people always think of complicated scenarios, such as robots, driverless cars. Microsoft decided to bridge this gap to make people realize that all these can be incorporated in everyday scenarios by introducing Power Platform which is a mature low-code platform to enable any kind of user base to make use of AI in everyday work and help businesses accelerate productivity and innovation. According to a Gartner report, almost 70% of the people spend time doing tasks which are repetitive. This is where these can be used. So for example, on the screen, if you see, we have Power Apps, which is for mobile and web business apps. We have a Power Automate for plug and play robotic process automation. We have PVA, uh, Power Virtual Agents for low-code chatbots. We'll see uh, all of these in action later on. And there are over 100 connectors with cloud and legacy systems, and they're all integrated to uh, with AI services. Great. So I think most companies see the benefits of these uh, the process efficiencies that come with these technologies. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned this is a, a low-code platform. I'd expect Microsoft as a service, um, it will, as a Microsoft service, it will integrate neatly and easily across the uh, product suite of Microsoft technologies like um, uh, email and calendar and, and, and chat messaging, etc. Yeah. 
So here's a reference architecture for one of our solutions so that uh, our customers get a better idea. So uh, if you see on the left, we have uh, triggers which can either be automated. So for example, you have email or social media platforms and the name of the company comes up, uh, then it gets triggered or it can be manual. Then we have a power automate orchestrator to organize the different type of flows such as UI flow for legacy apps and business flows for cloud apps. So you, UI flow is the your traditional uh, macro kind of screen recorder yeah. type uh, type solution. Yeah, yes. so, so that can in, input data into anything like mainframes through to SAP through to anything that is difficult to, to yeah. interact with. Yeah, yeah it, doesn't, and, it doesn't have APIs. Yes, the old uh, softwares with legacy uh, yeah. ones. Yeah, and this all is uh, so it's also connected to security via AAD Key Vault, uh, and then we have plug and play predictive and AI capabilities using AI Builder. We also have it connected uh, with MS Graph APIs for scheduling workflow approvals, and then um, legacy and cloud system connections via APIs and different kind of connectors. Uh, again, in this we can have a custom code built for uh, heavy integrations, and we can have a low code version as well. So. Anything. This is this is the kind of like initial diagram that we had with anything can talk to anything. Yeah. It's all up to you, your imagination on how you want to use these technologies to yeah. automate your entire enterprise from creating calendar uh, entries, integrating with Microsoft Notes, Word, Teams, email, you name it. It's powerful. So, yeah, like just building your own virtual workforce, if I may say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Great. So. You've got a demo for us, and um, do, do you want to take us through the demo, uh, overview of the demo before we actually go see it in action? Yeah, so if you talk about RPA, you know, it's so heavy when you hear it, but if you That's can see... Robotic process automation, yes. for, uh, yeah, okay. So, but if you see in this diagram, it's as simple as that. So if someone sends an email invoice uh, attachment, the bot identifies the email, it opens the attachment, it strips the fields out, uh, the important information. It looks up who the invoice approver is in uh, Microsoft Teams via, uh, sorry, in AAD, then accordingly sends them a message in Teams. If the approver says yes, it goes ahead and creates the invoice in SAP. Wow, so it's the bot that's sending a Teams message. Yes. Yeah, so that could be an email as well. It can be an email yeah. as well, but we think it'll be faster if it's not any Faster email. and people don't can ignore emails, can't yeah, they? The yeah. archive button's there too easy, isn't it? Um, okay, um, so let, let's let's uh, step through this then. So hopefully you can see it. So I'll, I'll keep pausing as we go through. Yeah. So it starts off with you're about to send the invoice in as the imagine you're the you're the you're the vendor. Yes. Uh, please pay me. <laughs> okay. So and there's so, an example of an automated trigger. Yeah. So oh, this is the trigger, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So tell us what's happening now. So. So I've received the invoice. As soon as I receive the invoice, the bot recognizes based on the attachment and the subject. So this is the bot. This is the thing here. It's yes. called flow, but you could call that anything. Yeah. Couldn't you? Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's sent you a message saying invoice has been received, value, and I'm guessing you could put any amount of text. Any in any here. kind of information and dynamically generated. Yeah, and this is called a card, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah, a card. So you could put pictures, videos, snapshot of the. If it's a scanned invoice, you could put the invoice in there. I'm exactly. Guessing. Yeah. Yeah. Hyperlinks. Could you do that? Yes, we can do that yeah. as well. And that'll link to SharePoint or OneDrive. Or, yeah. Okay. We'll see examples of that later on as well. Okay. So here you can also give our own buttons. So yeah. I've approved, reject, and process manually. Okay. Oh, so if you thought too difficult. I'll deal with this. Leave yeah. it alone, uh, Mr. Bot. So maybe you have some tricky customer vendor which you, yeah. you know, want to. In that case, you can just go ahead with process manually. Yeah, and you can put some extra comments in there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What happens next then? So as soon as it clicks approve, uh, this will trigger uh, an RPA flow for uh, SAP. So if you see, it's so, so fast. So this is the bot now. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Pause. So this is the the bot in the background, which yeah. is now firing this information into yes. SAP. So it, it could do it through an API in BAPIs, I'm guessing. Yes. Yeah, but but right now, so based on you can have it remotely somewhere doing this, or you can have it. So in that case, we we'll use RF, RFCs. But in this case, we are using a GUI yeah. if you want to maintain security and stuff. Great. So it's, it's done. So you can see, yeah, the document <laughs> has been created. Loaded. So how do you create a process like this? Uh, so you can see that uh, this is an example of the development environment. So it's nothing but a drag and drop, uh, easy GUI flow. Uh, so it's similar to creating a flowchart basically. Yeah. So and there are almost uh, so it's drag and drop of different components, 
and then there are almost 50 standard templates which are already available so you can take the best bits of each and combine and make your own oh, if so you, needed. So you're not starting from scratch exactly. you can almost copy and paste and yeah it's a, yeah and you can again so again in this there's a variation you can create your own uh like you know custom coded if you wanted more rigorous or something right okay so i can see there's no there's no code code yeah there's no like a c plus plus code anywhere here it's yeah. it's just here's a service and you're saying do this when a new email arrives so on and so forth so how, how long does it take to create this use case which is a fully functional use case which takes an in pulls an inbox takes an invoice reads the fields out of it um and using ai so it, you don't actually you don't have to say it's between these two. Mm -hmm. These, it, it will it will predict where it is the 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 net the net amount, gross amount, VAT, vendor, so on. How long does that take to create this end to end? Uh, so it will take around a week to get it tested and do it fully. But in a day, you could create the framework. Wow, wow. So can we see some other use cases of the technology that you've done before, so we get an idea of? what else you can do with it yeah yeah, yeah. so based on the invoice uh, so if you see the pdf what it does is it uses something called as ai builder so that's uh, a service on its own which extracts the fields and you have to train the model basically so as part of training you have to say give it around 10 different kinds of invoices and then uh, it will tell you what and then you tell it what it has to recognize from the invoice so i think what, what we've seen in the past is that if you, if you get 10 invoices from the same customer you load them in it will then pop up a prediction to say i think this is the vendor name i think this is the vendor id gross amount net amount so on and so forth and he says am i right and then you basically correct it and that's essentially training and that yeah. correction is just basically moving bot moving like rectangles around a screen to say no 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 net amount is this field currency yeah. is this field uh, then press save then again run some more through it review it yeah. get confidence and then and then it's done then you've, you've yeah. essentially trained the model which is this AI, AI builder piece yeah. and then it's good to go yes and that's quite quick isn't it yeah yeah and for variety it's important that we ingest more and more different types of invoices so for different companies have their own different formats so you just insert a couple from each format and it's yeah done. so essentially it is an OCR type yes. uh, of process but it's more Kind of advanced or the more modern way of yeah of, uh, because if you remember in OCR I've done it in MATLAB so you have to specify the pixel and the <laughs> black and white and all yeah. that so it's no longer that way it's a bit more advanced yes <laughs> yeah, yeah and and I think the, I think this is the beauty with a lot of the um, the AI and machine learning services that are available within Azure uh, Microsoft have taken away the you know defining the pics where the pixels are <laughs> so you don't have to do that anymore and um, and so it, it will do a lot of that for you however like a lot of the services that we cover today you'll see that there is a a probably a wizard version and a hardcore techie version as well so if you and most of the time we found the wizard version will get you 95 if not 99 percent there and then you can you can use the techie version to um, evolve that a little bit further if you've got any specific uh, requirements. Yep, yeah. It's using Azure, uh, so Azure um, Flow Orchestrator. So Power Azure, Automate. Or Power Automate. And in, in conjunction with AI Builder. So AI Builder is something you can use across any of the Power Platform product. And it has its own templates basically. So the one that we are using is for forms processing. So similarly, you have other templates as well for automated e email replies and stuff. Let's go through some of some of the uh, common common use cases. I mean, we could be here all day talking about <laughs> all of the ones that we've done. But uh, take us take us through it. So if you see the first one, that's the report extract dissemination. So this for all common extracts, uh, any kind of business function can be automated. For example, sales orders, open POs, uh, service orders, uh, any the data can be saved to Excel sheets or SQL DBs. Uh, and it can automatically send emails at the end of the day. So basically all reporting can be done, taken care of. Uh, the next one is business. Before you, before you go on to the next one, I think everybody knows teams of people that whose job it is to download data and send it out to people and and that is just complete can be completely automated can't it yeah yeah, yeah whether they go out by email put them on SharePoint send it through teams OneDrive so forth 
Brilliant. Like one of our customers, there are two people uh, who at the end of the day would just send out an email of the production orders that were punched in during mm. the day. So that was taken care of by the bot itself. And these so could be time. sending out to customers and vent, you know, vent uh, partners as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, the second one is the business data uploads. So here you can have a full-blown MDM solution or light one, if I if I'm correct. And uh, GR uploads uh, as well as invoice creation. That's one that we saw right now. So so you mentioned MDM. This could be like an enrichment activity, couldn't it? Yeah. yeah so you could you could automate that process yes. if you wanted a a a cheaper way of doing delivering an MDM yeah. uh, uh, service. Okay, and also wind shuttle. I mean, we, uh, there's how many people have got a wind shuttle team that whose job it is to load these materials in. Yeah, I mean, just yeah. give it to email it to a bot, and or or, or send it to a, a chat bot and say, can you load that for me, please? Yeah. I validated it's wrong. Do it again. Yeah. Okay, I fixed it. Right now, I'm going to load it. So the entire process can be taken. Out. It can also do its on its own some health checks on the master data as well yeah. to keep informing. Okay, and next one's. Oh, there's a nice one. There's the approval and for task chasing. So status reporting can be done. If some PRs are uh, not there, not approved, then it can chase. Uh, again, for pending GRs for invoices, then MRP failures where the material has not been yet, uh, you know, there for any plant. Yeah, so, so you're planning that. some material, but there's no, uh, the material's not been activated or there's no purchase order there. Yeah. You create a, a nag bot, exactly. a nag bot, which will go around telling, chasing people to get things done. So again, organisations have teams of people chasing people down to do things. Yeah. You don't need those teams of people because it could be automated. Yes. Wow, interesting, interesting. And then this one, this so this one's got three arrows going into SAP. What does that mean? Uh, so this is a use case of automated regression test packs. So in this, what can happen is you can do testing parallelly. Um, so basically, it reduces your test cycles from to just one third. So at the same time, it can run different testing scenarios. It, so you just have to prepare the sample data and then it will run different scenarios based on whatever you have customized. So this is a non-production use case. This is um, in your kind of BAU track. Yeah. So you, you, you've got a new, some, a new a regression uh, scenario because um, your project team is pushing through some new functionality. You want to make sure they haven't broken anything. Mm. So you might have some example sales orders in there that you just want to push through and yeah. get the bot to load it for you and then check the results and then report back. Yeah. And Actually, interestingly, you can also create the sample data. So you can also ask it to fetch the data, previous data, and then okay. create it. Okay. So find 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 the top customers, yeah. find their sales orders, yeah. duplicate them, change the numbers, fire it back in, and see if it still works. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And then the multiple arrows is um, is referring to the fact that you could scale this for potentially performance testing. Yeah. So yeah. you could have as many bots as you wanted to firing, firing data in, creating some noise in the system. Yeah. Um, if you want, because I find that so it's often quite difficult to do if when you're um, uh, when you're a project team, you want noise in the system to see when you're doing performance stress and volume testing yeah. to to track what's my impact. Have I slowed things down or not? Okay. And finally. The ITHR service desk automation. This is the one that we recently implemented. So it's uh, for uh, basically the HR service desk and IT service desk. Uh, so any any kind of tickets that you would want to raise. Right. So you just call, talk to the bot and it will solve most of your problems. Brilliant. And so it will it will do the it will deal with the first line troubleshooting with the user. Yeah. Have you switched it off and on again? All of those kind of questions. Uh, guide the user through your common response, uh, common resolutions, and then if if it does need to be dealt with uh, through a ticket process, it can it can collect the data from the user and then create the ticket in the background. Yes. It can also call an agent when it is necessary for escalation, and it's all seamless, so the user won't even understand that you know it's gone to a live agent. Wow, and I think that 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 can link in with Dynamics 365 as well for more sophisticated queuing and uh, allocating out tickets to or, or chats, isn't isn't it? So yeah. if it, if it, if the chat bot can't handle it, it's too difficult. It can seamlessly hand it over to a a, a, a professional user who's an expert in networking, DBA, whatever the skill sets are. Yeah. Okay, really interesting. Cool. So um, I think that's it. So now, so now we're going to talk about chatbots. And uh, again, it's you, Akash, you're an expert in all these areas. So um, chatbots. Um, 
tell us, we, I think people have seen chatbots with Amazon. I think I've used it before. It wasn't a very good one, to be honest. Um, not AWS, but I, I, was, I was trying to send something back and it wasn't helpful. But yeah, so I think some people have had different mixed experiences with chatbots. It'd be really interesting if you give us an overview of what does the, the Azure chatbot uh, service look like. Uh, so if you see, this is the, at, in one screen, you can see what all services are orders. So the chatbots span across multiple devices, multiple channels, except multiple inputs. Uh, they have multiple personality spectrum. So it can be a witty bot or it can be a serious bot. It's just a scale that you have to adjust. So you, you can adjust how its personality from being kind of like very easygoing, witty, comical, um, through to being very serious. Yeah. So depending on what your organization is, so I suppose if you're a legal firm, you don't want kind of like okay. um, uh, the, some, yeah. of the, some of the loose comments that we've seen on one of our chatbots all the way through to uh, nice and witty and friendly, which you might want for different kind of uh, organizations. Yeah. So basically you can impart the culture that your organization has culture. to this chatbot. Brilliant. Yeah. So uh, it also has a knowledge base which can be uploaded from any source. Uh, so think of it as like uh, the matrix. Yeah. So, you know, if uh, the user uh, in Matrix, uh, they want to learn, learn Kung Fu and then they just plug in right. and, you know, it learns, the user learns in like five minutes. So you just drag and drop the content that your, that your, that your chatbot needs to be able to speak to people about files, PDFs, you name it, website links, drop, drag and drop it into the knowledge source and all of a sudden your chatbot will be able to talk about yeah. and answer questions on that, even yes. if it was Kung Fu. Yeah. yeah. And it also has a learning capability, auto-learning. So yeah. basically, uh, based on the phrase that you have entered, it will alt automatically generate more 50 phrases. So okay. uh, it, it has the ability to learn itself. So you don't have to code. If if Akrash says <laughs> this, then I say that. It doesn't have, It's not like that, is yeah. it? You just yeah. drag content information into the knowledge base and that's it. Yeah. And then the chatbot will just count and then define how witty, friendly, serious it needs to be, and then you're good to go. Yeah. So basically, it helps the users from not coding such if else loops, so they can invest their time in doing you know yeah. the tricky bits. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so can we see a reference architecture for for what it looks like? Yeah. Oof. So oh. <laughs> guide us through it. So uh, there's a sample enterprise implementation for one of our solutions. So this is a this is a more complicated one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. So, but this will give an idea for the users how we are integrating both the custom ones and the easy code. So if you see, we have two flavors. One is the Power Virtual Agents and the Bot Framework, which is for the custom bots. So the Power Virtual Agents is the low code one, which is for basic yeah. FAQs and stuff. Yeah. And we have the Bot Framework, which is, which is for custom uh, applications, legacy interactions. So if you wanted your bot to speak, to connect to SAP and start finding data in SAP based on a request, that's kind of something that you do some custom code for. Yeah, yeah. But if you wanted to basically have the bot be able to respond to any question yeah. from a list of Word documents, websites, PDFs, that's where your Power Virtual Agent will come in, your exactly. low-code version. Yeah. Okay. And even in that integration bits, now you'll see an example. So we have co bot cognition and intelligence where we uh, use all the cognitive skills which uh, uh, Hamad spoke about in the previous section. So for example, understanding what the request is gets taken care by the Lewis component. Uh, then we have also integrated it with Azure DevOps for uh, code management and with my Microsoft Dynamics 365 for seamless uh, live human agent handoff. Uh, also connected to SAP and ITSD applications, uh, various knowledge sources. We have also included workflow automation uh, using Power Automate for calendar management, approval requests, uh, emails, etc. And all of this is securely managed with AD access and key walls. Great. So you've got a demo. So let's have a look at this. Uh, tell us what this demo is going to do. Um, it's a SAP bot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the bot is going to interact with SAP and it's going to retrieve the data based on user requests that were in Teams. So this is delivered through Teams. It doesn't have to be Teams. You could deliver it through a, a website. Yeah. So this is, a, this is a witty bot, isn't it? Yeah. So you said, hey, this is your support bot. And you can see how fast the interaction is. 
yeah. and see with the replies it's witty. So we didn't code that. It yeah. just this is the this is what witty bot does. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, the first oh. one is where I asked him to fetch me open sales orders for customer, and uh, this is a kind of an adaptive card. So you can see the variety in which the information is de displayed. It has also created uh, and a spreadsheet in OneDrive, so I can look at this and do some further analysis. So you've said fetch me some data. Based on your authorization level, it's checked you out. You can do that. Yeah. It's going to pull that data into a spreadsheet and then aggregated it up and provided a nice little um, display there. That was yeah. quick. If you wanted that information from SAP, personally, I'd have to re remember, I have to Google the T code because <laughs> I can't remember. You might need to do a few little um, Excel spreadsheet downloads, faff around. Easily an hour's worth of faffing, isn't it? Yeah. And, and even choosing the uh, num fields that are being displayed for your user yeah. ID. Yeah. Um, the second one is a use case for knowledge base. So herein I've asked uh, that how do I create a source list? So you can see that it has given me uh, how to create it along with a screenshot. Uh, so you can see the variety of information that gets displayed in the knowledge base. So we've got a PDF that we've dragged and dropped into into the knowledge base, which essentially has got this information in it. Yeah. That's all we've done. Yes. And then from that, the the chatbot has been able to answer that quite associate that question that. to this bit of content yeah. content in what is a 300 page PDF pulled that out and presented the results with it with a picture yeah so it's powerful stuff and, the and we haven't had to code anything there was no coding <laughs> for that was there no no nope. nope. oh sorry that's my fault uh, there we go so the third one is for the inventory use case. This is a famous one which very comes Very common, up. very yeah. common. So I've asked it to show me the stock of material 450B and it has displayed me in this format. Uh, I can also further ask it to create a stock transfer for this and it will go and punch in using the earlier process that we showed you. And this could, look, this, this could be looking across multiple um, SAP systems, non-SAP systems, aggregating the results, yeah. you name it. And uh, this final one is where I ask it to show me the balance of the GL account and you see that it recognizes that I don't have access to it and uh, so it gives me a follow up where I can ask for uh, access and uh, it sends an approval and everything happens in the background. I'll show how it actually happens in the next demo. So this is where we, this is a, a, a approval. So just note, this is not through Teams. This is this is a chatbot, which is again, same kind of back end service, but delivered through a web application. Yeah. So you can see that it has multilingual capabilities. Uh, so I'm going to proceed with English. So you could speak in Spanish if you want, and yeah. it still still yeah. do this. Yeah, supports 50 languages, doesn't it? Yeah. And uh, here it gives me suggestions. When I say approval, it automatically gives me suggestions what all it has in the background. So here I want an access to a SharePoint folder, and it will ask me for the details. Once I've given those details, you can see this is the Teams channel, a uh, Teams window for the uh, approver and you can see this is how the request gets displayed so you, uh, so you put the request in i need access to folder x yeah the chatbot said let me go and, let me go and sort that out it's then gone and found the person who needs to approve it this is the person yeah it's then give ping them on teams to say oi this guy akrash wants access to a folder do you approve or not and it's given these these uh these options so uh, i can approve and once i approve you see that it goes in the background, gives me the approval in AD, and, and so straight into Active Azure Active Directory. It's done the update. If it needs to update a ticket in um, whatever remedy system, whatever it's part of your and, normal audit trail, it can do that. It will call an API call separately, yeah. and can be done parallelly. And done. if you see, um, it will also send you. Uh, now you'll see in the window. So this is uh, the uh, window of the uh, the person who had asked for approval. And you can see that person also gets a notification. So he gets a message in Teams. Brilliant. Yeah. So let's have a look at the uh, development environment for, for this. So you see this is the, um, again, a GUI-based uh, flow diagram kind of a, uh, you know, uh, development environment. You can drag and drop various components, uh, question answer format, and you can directly integrate it with Power Automate for easily integrating workflows and robotic process automation. So this is for uh, the low code uh, flavor basically, mm -hmm. and it just takes 15 minutes to develop a FAQ bot. 15 minutes? Yeah. Wow. I think Dave was going to ask you a question. Dave, do you want to <laughs> jump in? Yeah. So in this case, uh, we have done it. If you see in the uh, in this diagram, we have done it with Sharewell, and for that we had used the custom bot flavor. So in that case, uh, it would send an API call and uh, do it. 
Yeah. So we've we've inter we inter in this I think in this scenario we use we integrated with Cherwell to provide uh, first line for uh, for ticket creation. Uh, tell me my latest tickets. I want to escalate a ticket. I want to close it now. I think it's resolved yeah. and deal with any kind of uh, first line uh, response problems yeah. with end users. Yeah. But essentially, it will connect. We've done it with Remedy, ServiceNow, um, Churwell as an example. You you unbounded with the uh, Dynamics 365, right? Naturally integrates with yeah. for ticket management. So if you want like a real time resolution and you want agents to just uh, pop, you know come in whenever the bot is not able to solve any uh, kind of request, then you can integrate it with Dynamics. Uh, I think importantly, this we we delivered that in about two, just over two months, two or three months. Yeah. And we didn't have to change the world. We just essentially said we we we, we presented a chatbot which could integrate with Cherwell. Um, there was here's some knowledge in here. Um, we trained trained the bot, and then essentially said right, okay, let's start pointing some users to the team. And we delivered it through Teams, and and people we didn't have to change anything because we we were still in using Cherwell, the IT service desk application to be the master data source ultimately. We weren't trying to change any of that. Yeah. Uh, we just front ending and reducing headcount in, yeah. the, in the service desk team. And you know, most of the times people were bored of just typing that email first and sending it out. Mm. And this was much easier because we made the bot in such a way that it was kind of a, like an app. So it was basically, it used to prompt for everything. So it was very less typing for the users and mm. easy ticket creation. Push buttons, didn't they? Push, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oops, uh, okay. Conscious attacks. This is a development environment, so again, very similar look and feel to 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 the rest of them. I think that that's it on the um, on the on on the bot side of things and RPA. Yes. Anyone have any questions before we go on to mixed reality? More shiny things. <laughs> so thank you, Akrash. Um, thank you. Akrash is going to be available for any questions that you might think of uh, towards the end. Um, We've now got Sarge again, who's going to give us um, again overview of what mixed reality is, reference architectures, and some really interesting demos. So, Sarge, what is mixed reality? Uh, I, that's a very good question. I get that that question asked a lot. So, if you look at the diagram here, I think that's the best way to show it. So, on the left, we have virtual reality, but there's no concept of your real world. Yeah. On the other end of the spectrum, so on the right, we have augmented reality. But there's digital content, but it doesn't interact with your physical objects, such as your tables and chairs. Combining these two, you get mixed reality, also known as your spatial in-context experience. So for example, now you're using a hologram, hologram, in this case a duck, you can place it on the floor, on the table, or on the chair. So it's in context. So the digital thing is in context of the real world and can interact with it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, We've got a demo, so tell us what the demos. Yeah, are about. sure. Uh, yeah, we want to demonstrate two use cases for customers uh, to show what a mixed reality experience is. One guides, which is an immersive training aid, and another one remote access to support so, uh, solutions for field engineers. To do so, we build an in-house factory assembly station, as you can see on the left. And if you put things together, it looks something like on the right. It's basically assembly station, oh, isn't it? For, yeah. For um, uh, like as in an, 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 in an enterprise to see if we could use demonstrate guides, um, Azure guides as a way to improve the process for as part of an immersive training experience. So let's have a look at how how does it work and what does it look like? Yeah. So we define a number of required steps for, for a particular guide. You can use various inbuilt holograms to place on physical objects. And then, for example, in here, step one, you have an animated hologram showing where to place a particular component. In this case, component D places as shown by the animated hologram. Again, you can have as many steps as needed for a particular guy. Uh, so you can just always expand on this. And again, in step four, a new animated hologram and a new st instruction to take component one. And we can expand this to include media files such as images, pictures, for a more in-depth training. Great, great. So any amount of sequence steps can be easily programmed into, say programmed? Uh, no. We don't need an expert, anyone who, we don't even need an Doesn't need a developer. Yeah, developer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, really interesting. Really interesting. Cool. So let's have a look at the uh, the reference. Oh, we've got a uh, fact check down there. So um, it was a uh, Forrester research said that there's a fourfold improved knowledge retention when people 
uh, learn through immersive training experiences. It's correct, isn't it? So here's a reference architecture. Wow, I was expecting a little bit more complexity <laughs> than, than, than this. Yeah, so yeah. talk us through it. Yes, uh, very simple. So if you have an author, you create the guides. A uh, very simple process for them. So he's not in a white white scientific jacket, no, like no. professor of uh, 3D holograms. Exactly. You no. just need someone who's an expert in their field. Uh, you see, a field yeah. engineer. So a business process. Yeah. Exactly. Lead. Yeah. They just set it up. They can they... author in guides. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And then finally, the operator selects the guides to play and goes through the training manual. That's as far. As, wow. so that's the simplest way to summarize. <laughs> Quite simple. <laughs> yeah. So Power BI, that's just for reporting of who's using what. Exactly, and looking at the, the training times of the average tra training times, for example. Yeah. Yeah. As this, but and then and then I suppose that an organisation would end up creating a catalogue or mm. library mm. Of, of of training courses that will be managed in here as well. Yes, correct. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Brilliant. That's uh, quite quite uh, interesting stuff. And that again, so that's using Hololens. We were looking through a Hololens exactly, device yeah. then, yeah. where we so that meant that. You, you, your hands were free mm. while to, to do the doing mm. um, with it, and then the, the visual um, what's the word the, 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 the digital hologram that you saw is presented in front of you through that through that screen that you showed us before exactly. cool so the next one is a remote assist yeah so I've got the hololens on initially so I'm initiating a call very similar to your team's call so this would be like field engineers I need some help mm. uh, I want to call base up um, head office get some support because I'm in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And then uh, once I'm connected to a specialist, uh, the specialist can draw uh, holographic Im holographic pictures on, on what I see. So this guy on the right is drawing in your field of view, yeah. arrows it, and circles. And they're, exactly, they, they're and they're spatially they're... anchored. So wherever I move, they remain in place. Right. Uh, and the specialist ha also has an option to upload, and upload a file. Okay, so he can see, he can see, so this guy on the right is talking to yeah. you, just like Teams. Exactly, yeah. And you can move him around. Yeah, to a convenient place. Yeah. Yeah. In this case, the person is, uh, the specialist is uploading a file. And he's looking through, he's seeing what we're seeing now, isn't he? Mm -hmm. So he can see through exactly your eyes. Exactly, what, what, what yeah. I'm seeing, exactly, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's the beauty of a HoloLens device, mm -hmm. because it, your hands are free, and you can move well, things around. This. Yeah, exactly, for yeah. example, moving to the left for to paste it conveniently, uh, from other things, and you said that that could be a word document or a exactly, PDF it could be word or video. Video, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and this is this is remote assist as a that's a an, an existing um, uh, software. Yeah. Software. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So reference architecture for yeah. it. So here we have an on-site field engineer who gets connected to a specialist, which can be found on your Azure Active Directory network. And then, if required, the specialist can upload a document from the local PC or OneDrive, a Word document, PDF, images. Yeah. So we, we I mean, there's a uh, Forbes Insights uh, got some statistics that said there's an 88 percent efficiency improvement uh, for in-field um, service engineers through these kind of digital technologies. And we can understand it. We hear these things from our, from our customers. We had a we had one example of. Uh, uh, an engineer had to be flown from the US to Japan to fix a piece of equipment and that because it was down and then I think it took I don't know 20 20 odd hours for him to get there lots of expense carbon footprint um, and then when he got there found out that it just needs a switch that needed to flick it up and if there was a HoloLens on site in that location as there is now instant it could be fixed within minutes couldn't exactly, it yeah. Yeah. yeah less cost less carbon footprint Greater customer satisfaction. Exactly. Great. So, I mean, yep, yeah, great reference architecture. So, I think we've got one more demo, full of demos today. So, this is the last demo. Yeah. T talk us through this. For yeah, uh, now we can expand the solution for a field engineer and include a mobile app, which was developed through Power Apps. So this, this is a mobile app, yeah. Power Apps connected to the experience that we were looking at before. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, let's, let's look at what it looks like. So, the app, app, app itself acts as a form of data capture. So you can see here different text fields you can enter, different date, date time. It looks just like a, an, an iPhone app. A exactly, app. yeah, it's a normal app. It's a normal so this app. is a power app. So you, you download power app Ups, from, the, yeah. from the app store and then, you and then create apps, apps yeah, exactly. and then they become provisioned in there through Microsoft Identity, I'm guessing. Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. And because it's provisioned through Microsoft Identity, the app itself is secure. Yeah. So authorization is handled. So we just captured a, an image, and then you digital can have a digital signature, signature. Yeah. love it. 
and then we've got some cognitive services up here. So yeah, so you, in this case, you are extracting information from a picture. So you're taking a picture, picture of yeah. an invoice. invoice. Yeah. Well, it could be anything, couldn't it? With, with a serial number on a piece of equipment. Yeah. And then again, this goes back to AI Builder, extracts the information, the key right. information. There we go. So AI see. Builder is identified the line items, yeah, from yep. that image. Yeah. And we can also scan a QR code to locate a particular sensor and, yep. in, and then look at the real time data that the sensor pushes to the cloud. Again, the sensor, tele the sensor pushes data to the cloud. And using this power ups, you can kind of do power BI and fetch that real time. So, IoT sensors pushing data through IoT hub, as we saw yeah. before, yeah. pushing data constantly. Now we're on the other end of the process. Exactly. An engineer's gone up to the, the actual piece of equipment, mm. it's got a, got a QR code on it to say this is you know equipment part number, uh, component 1234. We scan that QR code mm. and we can now pull down from Azure the real-time exactly. telemetry and display it in an app in almost real-time. Real-time, yeah. yeah. And again, as part of that um, field service uh, activity. Yeah. Wow. Excellent. So, uh, great way to finish our demos. Thank you very much, Thank Sarge. You. Yeah. And Thank you. now we're at the end of the, uh, of the, of the show, uh, guys. So, quick recap on, on what we've covered. Lots of things. We, we, we talked about Microsoft Identity, um, uh, sorry, modern workplace solutions, how they can all be connected together to create really, very very quickly, create really interesting uh, integrated solutions for, for customers tailored to any, any kind of scenario. Microsoft Identity shows you how you can provision applications, secure your organization, uh, and link in with an established data set of one and a half billion uh, users that are already there within uh, that are managed by Microsoft uh, Microsoft today. We talked about IoT. We saw some nice uh, holograms. Showed how you can um, get that data visualized in th in three D using holograms. We showed you with some fancy uh, HoloLens devices on how you can see that. You don't have to have a HoloLens. You can actually look at that on an iPad or or any other any other tablet device. We also talked about some of the risks around IoT and uh, some of the challenges that you need to be aware of when you when you're thinking about hooking up IoT devices into your uh, into your corporate networks. AI and cognitive services. How quickly and easily. RPA and chatbots can be created using low-code platforms like Power Automate and Power uh, Power Virtual Agent, and then finally uh, Mixed Reality, how it provides 88% improvement in first-line support and a four fourfold um, uh, improvement in training knowledge retention by end uh, end users. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any any questions um, on modern workplace solutions before we we hand back to the um, Microsoft team to to uh, close out the event? If you do think of any questions post event, uh, there's a lot to take in from this. Uh, feel free to send an email over. Thank you. Bye bye.